The Bene Gesserit, the Orange Catholic Church, Fremen religion, they're all the same. I mean, what are their goals? Is it human progress, peace, salvation, or is it control? and tyranny. Do the leaders even believe in their message? Or do they just have different names and slightly cooler fashion than today's people? Ah, Dune. One of the greatest sci-fi epics ever written. It's a soup of medieval titles, syncretic religion, interstellar space travel, drug use, anti-Catholic hysteria. It goes on endlessly. One of the great things about this book is that it focuses on the non-technological aspects of the future. Due to this event called the Butlerian Jihad, where all of the thinking machines were basically massacred. Now before I get bored deep into this video, I just want to let you guys know that this video has spoilers for the new Dune movie. So we start off with the Emperor giving June to House Atreides. Right from when we are greeted to the glistening sand particles rolling from the base of the shuttle door, we hear the echoes shouting the Sun al Ga'im as the mass of natives crowd just outside the Imperial Zone. Through poor, we, the readers, become entrenched in this story, guided by prophecies, betrayals, and the constant flurry of world building. We meet the Fremen, who traditionally call themselves the Mazir, which is actually the real life Arabic term for Egypt. Their fashion trend reminds me of the Arabic style of clothing. And if you guys step outside of the capital city of Arakeen, then we're basically inside the Arab desert. This uniqueness of Dune derives from its rich flavor of religious terms such as Arrakis, coming from the Arabic word Arrakis, meaning the cheap one, because the planet used to be thought of as having no value. Shai Halun. Shai means thing, and Halun means eternity. In Fremen culture, the worm is believed to be the grandfather of the deserts, the physical embodiments of the soul of the universe. Maudi, the guided one. Rooted in Islamic belief, it refers to the prophesied redeemer of Islam, who will appear at the end of times to redraw justice and righteousness on earth. To non-Islamic words like the Quasiric Hadarak, inspired by the Jewish concept of the Kevizat Hadarak, shortening of the way to speed travel between distant lands. Now there are tons of other words corresponding to Arabic or other cultures around the world in this book. Frank Herbert was very much influenced by an influential book by an influential person named Lawrence of Arabia. Now he was an officer to help the Arabs become free from the Ottoman overlords. Similar to poor Atreides who has been groomed to become the next ruler on Arrakis, both people lent their brains to a desert culture and their ears to traditional stories. Herbert had this ingenious idea of using messianic overtones in such a way to provide a world where outsiders can manipulate a culture according to their own purpose. So after the Harkonnens invade and then slaughter most of the Atreides forces on Arrakis, Paul and his mother are forced to escape into the desert. And here, both characters are luckily rescued by the partially sympathetic Fremen who take them into their stench after a intense welcoming party where they quickly adapt to their way of life. Just like how Lawrence sees the Arab lifestyle as cool and he adapts to them. Now if you guys want to learn more about the religion of the institutions on June, please check out some of these videos if you haven't already. Now I want you guys to close your eyes for a few seconds and imagine the most beautiful structure in the world. Some might say the Sagrada Familia, or the Hagna Sophia, or Birmingham. Whatever it is, the building probably has something to do with religion. For me personally, I'm a sucker for the Taj Mahal. I mean, just look at these beautiful unshaped domes and geometric patterns. If that isn't devotion to a lover, then I don't know what is. Whether through an expression of love for the divine or sheer aesthetics, tapping into religion can reveal the most alluring parts of what it means to be human. Religion itself is an art form. It can be used to hope for a better future. But the human species is complex. Some people happen to suffer from the minor flaw of killing 11 million people back in the 17th century, or convincing 39 people to commit suicide by drinking a lethal juice complemented with vodka so that their souls can escape from Earth, which is going to get annihilated by aliens. This was the Heaven's Gate cult back in the 90s.
In the first book of June, we come to see the Fremen as a very superstitious and religious group. In the brutal place of Arrakis, where water is sparse, it becomes extremely easy to admire the small things that keep you alive. So much so that they worship the worm as a shy halud, the physical embodiment of God. Most of the religious stories of the Fremen were actually created by the Benzi Generate Black Arm, the Misenora Protectiva. They introduced myths and prophecies among the population. Why? To exploit them later on. It was only after the embrace of Paul as a messiah did the Fremen go crazy and embark on a jihad across the known universe. Mohadib's jihad resulted in the death of over 61 billion people, the sterilization of over 90 planets, and the demoralization of over 500 additional worlds. For one inhospitable planet to committing space holocausts, it really begs the question, how can faith be so powerful? Faith is the trust in an idea despite uncertainty. Many religions promote a place of heaven or hell at the end of one's life. Yet, despite this system, it's actually not a big part of why faith is so hella addictive. When we come into this world and we grow up, we begin to view how cheating and violence unfortunately make up a big portion of our society. We may also experience the slow, tragic death of a loved one and wish to see them again. We are afraid that there is so much in our lives that we can't see until it hits us right in the nuts. So we turn to God. He says, mate, everything will be okay. You're a special person. You serve a special purpose. And we are all in this together. Carl Jung states, I cannot say I believe. I know. I've had had the experience of being crippled by something that is stronger than myself. Something that people call God. Some people take it a step further into religious fanaticism, which is also linked to this idea of in-group favoritism. Because humans are social creatures and we like groups a lot. In this case, the group is based on having a shared religion. Let's call this the in-group. And if there's an in-group, there's also an out-group. The out-group are the barbarians, the ones who have different attributes, like a different religion. With people who are like us, it is actually shown that we show greater empathy and positive attitudes towards the in-group members compared to the out-group ones. So when Paul arrives on the scene, a lot of the Fremen had actually believed that he was the Messiah already, the Mohadib, the one who would make the story of Alam al Matal, a reality, the one who would lead them onto paradise. So, this is kind of what the Fremen did because their race had practically been bullied for thousands of years. And if the whole universe hates you, you kind of hate them back. And with the arrival of Paul, he was the flint needed to unleash the hatred against everyone, which ironically sets the stage for an even bigger tyrant to come. You know, one really funny scene in June 2 was Stilgar. In the first half of the book and the previous movie, he was this old wise teacher of Paul. But as Paul began to embrace his identity as the Messiah, Stilgar transforms into just another devotee of him. He doesn't care to investigate the skepticism held by the Northern Fremen or the fact that Paul states that he is not the Messiah. Stilgar just basically sucks his toes saying, oh, the Messiah is being too humble that he's the Messiah. A second reason is that people become indoctrinated that their reality, their truth is superior. When individuals build their life around spreading whatever their beliefs are and they derive a sense of purpose from it, any non-believers will most likely seem as a threat. I mean, have you guys tried saying to a Napoli fan that their team sucks? So you guys hear that Frank Herbert whispering in your ear to Stop taking everything you see as gospel. The only gospel you should believe in is critical thinking, which at the moment is at an all-time low. When religion and politics travel in the same carts, the riders believe nothing can stand in their way. Their movements become headlong, faster and faster and faster. They put aside all thoughts of obstacles and forget that their precipice does not show itself to a man in a blind rush until it is too late. Herbert wrote the story to also critique the idolization of charismatic leaders. However, I myself would say that these leaders I feel less by sheer charisma and more by religious ideologies. This includes the Gone Path and a sense of religious duty to the people, the Fremen. 
Dr. Liet Kynes has this to say about heroes. No more terrible disaster could befall your people than for them to fall into the hands of a hero. What do heroes do? They save people. And if a hero is too good at their job, then people forget to save themselves. They become weak, waiting for others to rescue them. And as their reputation precedes them, this admiration is corrupted into blind devotion. And devotion deteriorates into violent fanatics. So bad that leaders themselves don't have the practical power power to stop them committing atrocities in their name. The chosen one is just some bloody myth. Paul can feel love. He does disgusting mortal things like farting or eating instant ramen at midnight. I mean, what the hell did these guys even do in their free time? In Dream Part 2, Paul has these repeated visions of billions dying if he went to southern Arrakis and claimed to be the Messiah. But if he stayed in the north, then Fade Rafter's army will fuck him up, and any dreamer partaking in revenge against the Emperor would be turned into dust. For this poor man, He's got no choice. Paul wanted to fix things, but he physically couldn't. He doesn't want to manipulate the Fremen. He saw that even if it took his own life to try to stop it, the result would still be catastrophic. Since the Fremen will make a martyr out of him, every action will lead back to the same path, a deterministic universe. And Paul, walking behind Chani, felt that a vital moment had passed him. Since he had missed an essential decision, it was now caught up in his own myth. He felt a new sense of the wonder at the limits of his gift. It was as though rode within the wave of time, sometime in its trough, sometimes on a crest. And through it all, the wild jihad still loomed ahead of him, the violence and the slaughter. One of the tragedies takes on the form of Leto II, the God Emperor. Leto II is truly a tragic character. Both Leto and Paul understand the horror of following the golden path. But Leto II chooses to run straight down the lane compared to Paul. He becomes a worm, which has many benefits. The first is that cosplaying as a worm was in fashion. But more importantly, it enabled him to live thousands of years. Thousands of years of tyranny, which is kind of like an eternity for humans. Which enabled the human species to experience peace, which equals a lack of mobility, equals to boredom, equals to a big itch for progress. So Leto II became a tyrant essentially to show them how living under oppression fucking sucks. Religion has this capacity to centralize. When power is held in a few people, humanity loses its ability to adapt, and so the extinction of the species becomes inevitable. When I set out to lead humankind along my golden path, I promised them a lesson their bones would remember. I know a profound pattern which humans deny with their words, even while their actions affirm it. They say they seek security and quiet, the condition that they call peace. Even as they speak, they create the seeds of turmoil and violence. If they find their quiet security, they squirm in it. How boring they find it. Look at them now. Look at what they do while I record these words. Huh. I give them enduring eons of enforced tranquility, which plods on and on, despite their every effort to escape into chaos. When individuals don't have power, they don't have the agency to realize that they are following people blindly. People are gullible. We have groups like the Flat Earth Society, which act like a religion, and people join. They think they're the shits, and don't even bother to critically think for themselves. It's not just Earth that's flat, but their brains too. The sense of belongingness has us building crazy communities from Scientology to look maxing. So before you head over to your religious meeting on Thursday or whatever, just try not to have any visions and start a holy war against Earth. That would make my day. Thank you very much.